Hey folks, it's Ray with Taste Radio. Right now I am honored and excited to be sitting down with the one and only Patrick Schwarzenegger. Patrick, how are you? I'm doing great, buddy. How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's been a while since we've uh, been on the Zoom together. You've joined us for many an episode of our Elevator Talk series as an incredible co-host offering lots of feedback, advice, insights to our early stage entrepreneurs. It's pretty cool to be doing this now because you are essentially in the seat that they have all been in, <laughs> that of an early stage entrepreneur as the co-founder and CEO of Mosh. Yes. Uh, wouldn't it be interesting for me to come on and, and pitch Mosh on one of those elevator talks or something? That would be, uh, that'd be a good change of, of roles for me. You know, we, we can make that happen if you want to make that happen. <laughs> we should. We should do it. It'd be fun. So when I was introducing you uh, as the co-host of these episodes, I would always introduce you as Patrick Schwarzenegger, an actor, model, investor, entrepreneur, where that sort of, out of those four descriptors, which order they all kind of fit in? Like, mm -hmm. how do you define yourself in terms of your career and what you do in terms of, I guess, all the different things that you do? First off, I think for majority of people, uh, they one of the things I always get kind of advice from a random person. They're like, hey, you know, Patrick, if I could tell you one thing, it would be to, you know, I, I don't know, you shouldn't really do the business and then the film thing. And then, the, you know, it's just too many things going on. They don't have anything to do with it. Um, but I'm a huge believer that uh, you don't need to really kind of fit inside of one box. And, and I'm also a big believer that you can be in different verticals in life as long as it's going towards your overall you know, vision and mission and, 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 and destination of where you're wanting to go. So for me, uh, film and business might not sound like they have anything to do with each other, but uh, they go perfectly hand in hand for me. I mean, everything I do with my film work and it uh, continues to build momentum for me in my career and, and grows my platform and my identity and my brand presence, that all correlates with the ability that I can help advise other companies, allows for better deal flow. Uh, allows me to use my platform uh, as a medium to get out a certain, you know, company or product. Um, so I, I think they actually go quite hand in hand. Um, modeling, I have no interest in. I've, you know, don't enjoy that. Don't want to go into that. Uh, I stopped that years ago. So I don't, you can, you can leave that one off of the, uh, the introduction. But uh, I think mostly for me, it's, it's, I would say entrepreneur is kind of the first thing that I would like to be known for. Well, there's a lot of overlapping that goes on. Uh, you are in the midst of filming a movie. You launched Mosh about two weeks ago as of this recording. Even though you say you're not a model, you did appear in Vanity Fair uh, a couple <laughs> months ago. Yeah, we saw that. Uh, where, where, Come on, I had to do that. That was a that was a twenty year Patrick Bateman reenactment. When they offered that to me, I was like, "Heck yes, I'm doing." It. I loved American Psycho, so I I did that one, you know, real real quick. And then as an investor, I mean, you're still making early stage investments in a lot of different brands. I have one on the table. I mean, that you've been involved with for some time. That's Super Coffee. So there's a lot of overlapping going on right, uh, in your right. life. But I got to wonder, I mean, how are you managing it all? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, look, I think the last decade of my life, uh, you know, I've always since I was a quote unquote customer and someone that was really passionate about the healthier uh, food and bed space, uh, the healthier alternative. That's what kind of started my career path of wanting to go and find and seek out these younger entrepreneurs and these products that were offering Americans uh, a healthier alternative to what was out there. And with my first investment in Blaze Pizza, which was pitched as the Chipotle of, of pizza and the healthier Domino's, that's kind of where it started. And it's continued to evolve year over year as technologies change, as more entrepreneurs have entered the game, as Americans have demanded healthier alternatives, and as the health and wellness spaces continue to rise and grown year over year. The past decade, it's been me helping other entrepreneurs. I've been helping them, whether that's raising funds, whether that's branding, whether that's marketing, whether that's coming up with different influencer campaigns, whether that's uh, bringing on different you know, strategic capital or, or celebrity endorsements or whatever that might be. This with Mosh is one of the first times that I've taken an idea from my mom and brought that into reality. And so the amount of work 
needed to do that is a totally different uh, game than, than me helping different entrepreneurs. Because in, in those respective companies before, there's always been a workhorse that's doing everything uh, you know, day in and day night. Super Coffee, for example, there's three brothers running the show. Uh, so for me to talk to them every week and helping from 10,000 feet up uh, is great, but there needs to be someone there that's running every day. Uh, for Mosh, that person is me. And it's been an extreme challenge for me during COVID, uh, especially dealing with the craziness of the supply chain and operations and your co-man kitchens and not being able to go there and be on the line when you're producing and having to trust someone through Zoom while being in Atlanta and filming night shoots and, and everything like that. But um, at the same time, it's like it's, it's this craving of, of this that I've always kind of wanted and loved. You know, it's like um, I was that weird kid that loved finals week, you know, like I, I always complained about having to study and cram and staying up all night and doing all nighters. But at the same time, I, I like loved it. And I just think that's kind of like in my blood and in my passion for this industry that, um, you know, it's it, it is a lot of work. There have been plenty of recent nights where I've barely slept and had to not go out on weekends and stay alone in my uh, my kitchen and just work and, and everything like that. But, but it's, it's a lot of fun and I'm learning so much. So. You were the only weird kid that I've ever heard of that loved finals week. I've never heard of anyone that loved those. My days. sister claims she does too. So I don't know, maybe we have two, okay. we have a bunch of weird people in our family. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it runs in the family. I don't know. You shared with me a story earlier, uh, about, uh, a supply chain issue that I bet a lot of people listening are facing in terms of uh, how they formulate their products. It may not be this, the exact same issue, right, right. but it's probably a pretty similar story. Can you share that with our audience? Yeah, I mean, first off, to anybody that's listening that is an entrepreneur that has a company out there rolling or is about to start one, uh, and you're going through production delays, you're going through supply chain delays, packaging, uh, anything like that, you know, first off, it's it's normal right now. I mean, in every industry, whether that's you're building a house and the lumber prices have skyrocketed or it's taking a lot longer, or if you're in the food and beverage space, um, we're seeing unprecedented times when it comes to lead times, to uh, lead times on ingredients, on production timelines, on uh, just getting your film wrappers. Uh, I mean, that, that box that's right in front of you, Ray, uh, that we customize for, for our, our sample packs, uh, you know, those before and even in the beginning of COVID were in eight to 10 day lead time. You know, now we're talking about six to eight weeks wow. uh, for, for box or for film wrappers, which is, I mean, if you're, you're a company that's, you know, thinking about producing in two or three weeks and you don't have film wrappers, you're totally screwed. Um, so it's been something that I think everybody's having to manage. And I've personally had to manage um, and it's been a tremendous learning experience for myself. But yeah, I mean, on the first days that we were producing this product and we had spent 18 months in R&D, perfecting this formula, working on every single aspect of uh, how do we make this bar taste delicious, but also be extremely nutritious and in in include all these different functional mushrooms and, and vitamins. And, and yes, there'll be some weird taste, but how do we mask that the best way possible? And we figured that out. It took forever, but we figured it out. And I was so excited to go to production and get this product out there because we had done test trials with hundreds of females and the bar was testing off the wazoo. I mean, it was just performing so well. And we produced. We finally got our production date. We got it in the film wrappers. And um, there was a chocolate liqueur shortage. And this, this specific chocolate we were using in this liqueur was something that was masking a lot of the different herbs and vitamins. And some of our bars got produced without that, that agent. And you could tell which ones were, which ones weren't, because there's an aftertaste on the, on, on the ones that, that, that weren't. Um, and I remember just getting those products and it was my birthday. I had gotten home at, at three or 4 a.m. in the morning. We were doing night Not shoots. Yeah, night shoots. I was going to say some people might think you were out drinking and partying, but no, no, I wasn't. I wish I was. <laughs> no, I was. I was coming back home from from set, and I just remember this awful feeling in my gut of just pure panic. And I don't get kind of anxiety attacks and stuff like that. And this time, I I did, 
And I just remember calling my girlfriend and having a full blown panic attack about it. Uh, and it was just an awful feeling. And then knowing that, you know, I had to put in another production order right away, but that would take eight to 10 weeks from the time that I cut the check. Um, you know, so all this to say is that, you know, nothing is, is perfect in the entrepreneurial life in any sort of life. Um, but you know, it's always, always ways to, to improve and to get the product out there and to work with your customers and customer support and make sure you're listening to your customers and hearing what are the reviews, how can you tweak, how can you change so that you, you're continuously improving and getting better. We had a very similar problem with Super Coffee years ago. I mean, four years ago or something like that when we were 100% Stevia based. Uh, in fact, the day that I had my, my first meeting with the three brothers, I tried the product and I couldn't swallow it. It was this extreme stevia aftertaste. And I told them that and they, they were like, I know we're working on it. It's this, this batch of stevia, it's this. And then they switched to a monk fruit and allulose blend eventually. But all that to say is, you know, it's never perfect, you know, but getting out there is the important part, really launching, getting customer feedback. But yeah, there's everyone's dealing with these supply and production issues. So did you feel really alone? Um, I mean, did you feel a sense of loneliness? I hear that from some entrepreneurs even if they do have co-founders, when things go wrong, it's tough to it's tough to manage it because you feel so responsible for whatever's happening. It was, I can't even explain it. It was honestly one of the worst whatever hours of my life. Like it was just, I felt gut-wrenched and it was the middle of the night. So I couldn't call anybody or talk to anybody. My girlfriend was working in Europe so I could talk to her, but um everybody else was, was either asleep or, you know, you can't call the, uh, the, the kitchen on, on, a, on a Saturday at 4am or something like that. But, you know, it, it definitely was. And, and my co-founder is my mom. So I wasn't going to, you know, call and wake her up in the middle of the night, but, um, you know, all that to say was, uh, you know, we, the thing that you need to realize is, okay, you're here right now. If, if you, if you really believe in that and, and want to be in the present moment, then you have to understand there's nothing you can do about the past. You can't fix that particular particular uh, product or whatever that is. And how, how do you go forward? So that's what we really had to focus on. And that's why I needed to put my own personal Patrick Schwarzenegger attention was, okay, this is where we are. We can't do anything about yesterday or the past. How do we fix tomorrow and this week and when customers get a product or when they're not loving it or anything like that so that we're set up the best for the future? And um, that's what I did. And that kind of turned my, maybe my anxiety into more of an excitement to how do I, how do I deliver the best possible thing for my customers? And, um, and again, you know, you're always going to go through these little hiccups when you have a company. I um, mean, it would be extremely unusual uh, to not go through problems, but, you know, I deal with different entrepreneurs every single day. And I've, I've, every single person that I've talked to has had some sort of problem on their first production runs, on their uh, wrappers and and film and you know delays and everything, so I think it's quite normal. I want to get into Mosh and talk about uh, the positioning of the brand and why you launched it. Um, let's back up, but just a second, you know, in terms of your investments and your focus as an entrepreneur, as an investor, um, food has been the sort of through line in almost everything that you do. Why food and why beverage? Well, specifically, I think that I was a struggling customer when I was growing up. My dad was a former bodybuild champion, actor, obsessive over what we ate, obsessive over his body, sugar, um, et cetera. So I was the lamest household pantry that you could find probably in America. We had chicken and broccoli and eggs and protein smoothies, right? Uh, and when I would go over to my friend's houses and see these things called Fruity Pebbles and Cocoa Puffs and, and Starbucks Frappuccinos, et cetera, it was like, oh, my God, these things are delicious. But as I got educated about certain ingredients such as sugar or such as other, um, you know, gums and other, you know, other ingredients that were in all these these uh, products, it made me interested to find out, are there products that are healthier alternatives that don't sacrifice price, flavor and taste? And the answer became, yes, there are. And I kind of made it my mission to, as a customer, first, first off and foremost, how can I go and use my platform to try to bring these products to the mainstream? 
And uh, that was my goal and continues to be my goal and to provide healthier with, you know, a healthier America and to reduce the sugar that's that's going on in America. And obesity is at an all time high. Uh, We've seen it continue to grow and climb during COVID. Um, So it's always just kind of been a a, a mission of mine to to utilize my platform um, to do that. And food and beverage are, are the perfect kind of ways to do that. And um, I think as time has evolved, customers have no longer looked for, okay, what's delicious? Okay, what's delicious, but also has some good macros. But now they're really demanding, what is this product going to do for me and for other parts of my body? Because it used to always just be the caloric load. Then it got into the high levels of protein. Now it's the low levels, low levels of sugar. And now people are like, well, is this going to help my, my gut? Is this going to help my, my mind? Is this going to help me perform better? Whatever. And that's kind of been the transition into mosh. My mom has spent the last 10, 20 years dedicating her life towards Alzheimer's and specifically towards the the female brain and brain research around uh, around a female after she lost her her father to Alzheimer's just over 10 years ago and found out that all the brain research was done on the male brain. And through her research and through the Cleveland Clinic, et cetera, um, you know, they've, they've found that, that women are actually two thirds of the cases of Alzheimer's or dementia are two thirds more likely to get brain related diseases. And now the next step is trying to fund that research to figure out why. And, uh, one of the biggest parts is, is food, right. And diet and sleep and exercise and socializing. And we kind of came together to create Mosh to try to fund that, that, that issue. But also to educate consumers that they are in the driver's seat. There are things that they can do today that will impact their brain health tomorrow, starting with food. And um, that's kind of how Mosh was born. And nutrition bars are the gateway to Mosh as a platform brand. Exactly. Um, Why start with bars? Why start with nutrition bars? Especially nowadays. I mean, I'm sure like during COVID, I think you, you pointed this out, uh, nutrition bars, protein bars, all those grab and go items didn't have yep. such a good year last right. year. The investor, Patrick Schwarzenegger <laughs> said, mom, this is, you know, the protein bar segment is down double digits year over year. No one's grabbing things on the go. No one's going anywhere. And I tried to persuade her to go, you know, to something else, but she was very adamant about sticking true to her story and being able to want to, to talk about Mosh in an organic fashion uh, to what was pertinent to her life and her lifestyle and her diet. And she's obsessed with bars. I mean, she eats a bar every single morning for breakfast and, hmm. and so much so that she had to give up bars for Lent. And so she was extremely adamant about creating a bar that was including of the certain vitamins and, and functional uh, mushrooms, et cetera, that were in her morning routine and her diet. And that followed a brain healthy lifestyle and diet without sugar, without any added sugars, uh, with high amounts of healthy, uh, fats from almonds and chia seeds and flax seeds, et cetera. So I, um, I said, all right, let's do it. You know, and she was very adamant that, you know, COVID's gonna, it's gonna slow down at some point and travel's gonna increase and people are going to be going back to work. And it's going to take us a lot of time to figure this out anyways. So that's what we started with. And you know, of course, if we weren't self-funded and had, you know, raised a bunch of money, I'm sure we could have started with a bunch of different product lines, but we really wanted to go out there and start small and, and learn from our customers. Are they responding to this messaging? Are they responding to this type of a product? And uh, what do we need to tweak and do? And what are the other product lines that these types of customers are demanding and build from there? So um, that's what we do. And, and I mean, you know, we had an extremely successful launch. Uh, you know, we didn't spend a dollar on any on any advertisements. We sold out in under six days. And, um, you know, we had hundreds of thousands of unique visitors to our site just through our uh, email list that we compiled or text text message group that we compiled. And then my mom and myself's uh, audience on socials and and whatnot. I, it's, it's a it's remarkable. You don't hear about brands selling out of their entire inventory six days into their launch. Uh, so congratulations on that. It's a a blessing and a curse, right? I mean, it's like, yeah. you know, I think day one, day two, I kind of looked to my mom and I was like, holy she, like, this is insane. We did not expect this. 
but I also said to her, holy she, because I can't get any inventory for eight weeks. Right. <laughs> and um, that's one of the problems that you're dealing with today during, during these times, you know? So it's so hard for a new company to, to do kind of supply and demand forecasting because uh, if you, you know, if you make too much and you have a lot of inventory that goes to waste, if you do too little, then you have weeks and weeks and weeks of, of downtime. So it was, um, yes, we went through products that we thought were going to last us through the Christmas holidays. So that was insane. Uh, the bad side is that we, we don't have products. So now our goal is how do we keep customers engaged and, and really, um, you know, interested in the next batch? Yeah, I don't know if they, uh, they covered that at USC Business School is what happens when you have no product and how do you keep people engaged? But the yeah. cool thing is you have academic experience. But you also have real world, real world experience in the number of brands that you've worked with and the experience that they've had. I got to ask you, you know, when you are drawing upon the experience of others, um, how did that impact how you thought about the most important elements of Mosh when you're talking about brand name, uh, positioning, ingredients? Um, you know, social marketing, all these things that are so important to modern brands, you know, was there an order of importance in terms of getting out of the gate and what consumers would latch on to as being the reason they're, pro they're buying your product? Right. We did everything against the grain. <laughs> hmm. We did everything that you probably are not supposed to do. Um, and I'll so, explain so, that. Like it's the opposite of elevator talk. It's like you're giving advice. Literally, I, I really do think so. And that, <laughs> that had a lot to do with my mom, not blaming her, but just saying that's this is, in the end of the day, this was her dream that I was responsible of trying to bring into reality. And we've had the, the best time doing it together and, and spent so much time on this. And I'm so happy we've, we've done everything the way we have. But first off and foremost, we did not start by creating a product. We started by having a mission. Right. My mom's mission has stayed the same from 20 years ago to 10 years ago to today. Just how she's getting through that mission into that end destination has changed, whether that's the medium of television, whether that's films, whether that's podcasts, whether that's newsletter, whether that's a product or a coloring book. Um, it's always to educate consumers that they are in the driver's seat with their brain health. So I think we we started off on a unique road by being a mission driven company. And we, we stand very proud with that today. Um, you know, we give 5% of all of our proceeds towards the women's Alzheimer's movement. Everything we do is not in the best interest of profits, but towards uh, expanding our overall mission. So that's how we started. Number two is when you would go to name a product like this, especially when you were trying to be in the brain health category, 99% of people would say, okay, try to try to create a name that's going to speak towards uh, the feeling that a customer is going to get or towards brain health or anything like that. So we had a laundry list of names from just plain old mind to uh, Meinstein to uh, Cerebellum to all these different names. And my mom just kept saying, I don't, I don't like, it's not resonating me. It's not resonating me. And then we did the company called MOS. That was our name, MOS. And we started to do some trials with individuals with the bars and testing. And they were like, oh, wow, these Moss bars are good. And my mom was like, no, 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 it's not called Moss. It's MOS. And they were like, and well, MOS stands for, those are your mom's initials, right? Maria Owen Schreiber. And they were like, well, I read it as Moss. And my mom was like pulling her hair out. And she was like, I cannot let this happen. And she was like, maybe we're just MOS health. And we were like, okay, let's try that. And then she wrote it out. M O S H and then health. And then she was like, Oh my God, mosh. I'm just going to call it mosh. And, uh, and then that's where we came up with the name. So yes, it, it means Maria Owing Shriver health. And we have other different meanings behind the name as well. It's very close to nosh as you know. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's where we came up with the name. So those are kind of the two things right away that were, that kind of stood out as being different. The last one, and I won't bore you with more of this, but the last one is, is the branding. Um, a lot of people wanted us to go really funky and, and unique to stand out on the shelf. Um, and we had a lot of problems with our branding of what were the colors going to be. Purple is very, um, you know, kind of hand in hand with Alzheimer's, the color. 
And um, we kept going and we have over like a hundred iterations of different colors and, and different branding. And finally, my mom kind of was like, let's go back to our mission. And that's kind of brain health and everything. Why don't we take a female brain scan colors and put that across our, our branding and across the inside of our, our packaging and on the bars. So if you open up that box and you turn it towards us, the colors on the inside and the bottom and stuff is actually stemmed from a brain scan. And then what they did was they, they splashed it out uh, and kind of made it into a, uh, a gradation of it. But so it, it was cool. I mean, everything, it was really interesting to hear her point of view on everything and always going back towards the mission. And, uh, you know, every little attention to detail has been really, really going back to that mission. Um, but yeah, we definitely didn't follow probably the investor guidelines. <laughs> well, I, I assume as an investor, you're also looking for mainstream opportunities, things that can resonate with many, many consumers. And I think in some ways, Mosh feels very targeted in who it is going after. So. Is there is there a mainstream opportunity for Mosh? Do you see this as being a brand for for all people, or is that sort of niche play still scalable? I really truly do believe that this is something that could be very large and 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 to the masses, and I'll tell you why. The thing we always want to do with every product we want to want to create uh, again against the investor guidelines. Everyone said the bar category is declining. There's so much competition. You'll never make it or break it out of that segment. And um, we always wanted to see how can we impact the most amount of people. And the bar category is still massive. Sure, it's growing one to 2.8% a year now, you know, before COVID and now it's bouncing back. But um, how can we go and capture these people that were eating bars and on the go, which is predominantly women, how can we get them to not only start thinking about their biceps, their triceps or their thighs, but now how can we start to get them to think about all of that plus their brain? So let's let's start to create a brain plus body health. And um, I truly believe that people will start to be like, OK, if this does taste really good, if this does check the boxes of the three top things that Americans are looking for, which is less sugar, more protein and something that is price affordable. How can I go with those things and now start to think about brain plus body health? This is doing everything another bar is doing, plus adding the brain element. And I think that cognitive function, cognitive decline was, I think this last year, number four fastest growing CPG trend, uh, just behind keto hydration and functional uh, beverages. Uh, so I think it's going to continue to grow. And the beautiful thing is it's not only growing amongst my mom's age range. There are people my age that are really interested in how do I continue to build my performance when it comes to my brain? How do I become more productive at work, at my desk? And I think that's significantly changed post-COVID. I mean, quote unquote, post-COVID, however you want to call that. Um, and so I really do think that we can create a plethora of product lines that speak to brain plus body health. Well, I mean, it seems like you're on the right track. If you're, if you're selling out of all your bars in the first six days, it seems like there is a lot of interest in not only the function, but the form as well. Um, that being said, you've mentioned a couple of times, it goes against the grain in terms of investor guidelines. Right. And by investor guidelines, I assume you're talking about your personal investor guidelines. And I do want to get into you know, the thought process of, okay, Blaze, Let's start with Blaze in terms of why you saw this as an investable opportunity, what you learned from that experience and how you applied it to future investments as well, um, in particular, a brand like Super Coffee, because, I mean, Blaze and Super Coffee are remarkable brands and remarkably fast growing brands. How mm -hmm. did you identify that they could uh, right. that they could scale and grow in the way that they have? Yeah, uh, Blaze, Super Coffee and Liquid IV as well, which actually sure, was... Yeah the largest of the revenues, you know, those three companies grew from, uh, well, Liquid IV, it took a little bit longer, but then they had massive hyper growth the last three or four years from going from 20 to 50, 100, 200 million plus um, of revenue. But it really goes back to just my overall, I don't, I'm not the most, you know, sophisticated, educated investor in uh, doing all these different graphs and comparing X, Y, and Z. I really go back to my core thesis of, is this a product that is providing a healthier alternative to the American 
that's going into a growing uh, trend or something that is quite large. At the time when I did pizza, Blaze Pizza, uh, pizza was a massive, massive category in, in the US, continues to grow. I mean, if you bought Domino's stock, Ray, when I started Blaze Pizza, it's outperformed Apple. It's an insane stock and pizza continues to grow. So that's one of the things that was the interesting part. And then the other massive opportunity was customers no longer wanted to just buy their pizza or their burritos or whatever. They wanted to watch their product get made. They wanted to have a personalized say in how their uh, product was being made and they wanted to watch it. So that's all Blaze was, was we're going to give the customer what they want. We're going to allow them to customize it. We're going to allow them to watch them be customized. And we're going to have them go down the aisle. So the perception of time waiting for their pizza is way less. And we're going to do that all under $10. So that was Blaze Pizza. And Chipotle was already growing massive share. Uh, Subway was already dominating. Jersey Mike's was on the come up. And so it was just a very clear um, investment for me. And it was started by Rick Wetzel, who started Wetzel's Pretzels. He had operational success. So it was a no-brainer for me. Super coffee was, okay, coffee is continuously the fastest growing drink, drink segment at that time. Cold brew in that specific year was a, a new phenomenon that no one had ever heard of or tried that was supposed to be less acidic, easier on the gut, and boom, it hits you like a truck with the amount of caffeine. Perfect. And Bulletproof had just started. Uh, they were growing tremendously, but they were high in calories, weren't really applicable towards the female audience. Um, and so these three brothers in their college dorm room said, we're going to make something that's not only for the college athlete, but also for the female uh, that wants something that's below 100 calories that has some protein. And at the same time, breakfast on the go, RTDs were the two fastest growing segments on Amazon Health and on Google Trends for, for CPG. So combined with all of those things, I, I bet on Super Coffee. And, um, and it was just you know, positioned as the healthier Starbucks Frappuccino. These three brothers had no idea how to run a business, didn't know anything about entrepreneurialism, but they were workhorses and would do anything possible to bring this mission out to the world of, of less sugar and spreading positivity. So I bet on them. Same thing with Liquid IV. It was just Gatorade was um, a tremendous sports drink. Body Armor had started to inch in, inch in, inch in. Kobe was starting to talk about you know, not just cane sugar, but electrolytes from coconut water and healthier sugars. And, and this guy, Brandon was like, Fuck, I'm going to make something that's half the amount of sugar. And, uh, and I'm going to make it on the go so that when you ship it, it's super cheap. And, and the product margins are in the seventies and 80%. And I was like, this is genius. And uh, it was the same thing there. So really, I just um, always focus on where the customers are and providing that, that, that healthier alternative. The three brands that you talked about, you gave reasons for your investment in each of them. For Blaze, it was trend and management. For Liquid IV, it was velocity uh, and innovation to a certain extent. For Super Coffee, it was uh, innovation, trend, but not so much management because these were unproven entrepreneurs. Yeah. Uh, is there an order of importance in terms of your investment strategy? Is it management? Is it innovation? Is it velocity? When I first made my Blaze Pizza investment 10 years ago, you didn't hear, you didn't have these taste radio elevator pitches with a bunch of 22 year old, 25 year old, 27 year old people that are dropping out of college that aren't going to college because they want to start a product that wasn't really happening back then. Of course it was to a certain degree, but Today, you're finding any single company and every single company that's being started by people of all different age ranges uh, and experience levels. One of our company's nugs that I invested in a year and a half or two ago was started at the time by a 16-year-old kid from Australia. I mean, are you kidding me? You couldn't stack the cards against him more. He had no experience, didn't have any college experience, didn't have a business school regimen, didn't have any of that stuff. And now he just raised at, what, $255 million and is having tremendous success in the retail push and has had amazing direct consumer success. It's for me, I'm less worried about the entrepreneur's past or record or what college did they go to or what's their resume or degree um, rather than what is their determination and willingness to go through hardship and learn and really push out the mission of what they truly believe in which is that, that product and using that product as a medium. Um, 
because no matter how experienced you are, you're going to go through bumps uh, during this entrepreneurial grind. And, and do you have what it takes to continuously shift and move and uh, adapt to the times? And uh, I love to bet on people that will and that I think will. Um, so that's a huge part of my, my investing is betting on the jockey. Uh, next is, is really the product, right? Do I believe that there's a product uh, market fit? Do I think that there's a mass appeal for this type of product and are there customers out there? And um, is it a product that I believe in and would use as a customer myself? That's huge. And then process is, is probably the least of it. Um, the operational side of things, because I've I would say I've continued to learn and grow in that field myself. And I would be lying to you if I said I made a, a bet on the operations of Super Coffee or Blaze Pizza back then, because I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> um, how many investments in the food and beverage space have you made to date? Maybe 15 to 20. And I'm sure some have worked out better than others. But given your answer about betting on the individual, betting on the founder, have there been any mistakes that you've made? I, I guess, have you been- Outside you know, of the food space, yes. Outside of the food space. Yes. There's yeah. been two examples, my worst investment and my, could end up being actually my best investment have happened outside the food space. Uh, and one was a the wrong bet on judgment of character by my side. And the other one was a, I had no idea about this space or this field as an outdoor furniture company called Outer. I know nothing about furniture or those operations or anything like that. But this one guy, Jake, just kept coming after me, kept coming after me saying why they wanted me as an investor and kept writing me letters and emails, just being so like determined. And at some point I was like, you know what, man, just meet me at this place for coffee so I can just listen to you. And he was so convincing and, and just so pushing on how hard of a worker and how determined he was to make this successful and all these different things. I wrote him a check and uh, that company was last year was the fastest growing direct consumer company in all of period outer. I mean, obviously they benefited from COVID being an outdoor company, but they just raised that hundreds of, of millions and, and I bet on him pre revenue. So it ends up, could end up being my best investment ever. Uh, and then the other side of it was, will be my worst investment ever. <laughs> what was it about the guy that uh, you made the mistake on? What was it about his, uh, his character that you believed in and then realized was not the case? I was in love with their product uh, more than I was with them. And I think I just convinced myself that, that they were smarter or hardworking than I, than I thought. And, and it was just the entrepreneurial like raising of monies and these valuations and stuff got really caught up with them and living lavishly and, and uh, living outside their means and stuff like that. And I won't say the company or the people obviously, but it just caught up to them and it just ended up spiraling out of control. And, and when there was severe hardship at the company, they bailed to another place. So it was just uh, all too telling at that point. That's unfortunate to hear. And um, I think, you know, when you start to see founders that uh, haven't made a dime yet are driving Ferraris, uh, it's definitely a telltale sign that something's not right. Something's off with the, with the company. Um, That's literally happens. what happened, except it was yeah. a Ford. But he had a nicer car than me. I remember we were on a plane and I wasn't in first class and he was, and I was like, what the hell is going on here? And uh, yeah. You've made some good bets. You've made uh, some intelligent decisions when it comes to, uh, you know, how you spend your time and, 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 your, and your money. At the same time, I feel like there's a lot of brands that are going to come knocking on your door. And even though you are actively involved in the food and beverage space, I'm sure you don't want, you know, the kind of persistence or you, you just couldn't, I guess, manage the kind of persistence that some people are, are going to take, that some people are yeah. going to be sending you LinkedIn messages two or three times a day to get your attention. So what really does get your attention? What's that first email, phone call, LinkedIn message look like? You know, what are the ones that really stood out to you said, you know what, I have to, I have to follow up on this. 
Yeah, well, I think for the in the case of outer, it was kind of maybe before I had some multiple successes in the investment in CPG field. So I, maybe I had a little more, I uh, didn't have as much influx into my inbox. Uh, so it made me more willing to, to respond to him. Today, it's a lot different and not to toot my own horn, but I get a lot of a lot, a lot of messages and in, in LinkedIn, particularly where it's like, I can't, I can't go through all of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just loads of messages and people pitching me on companies and, and everything like that. I will never be able to get to everybody. I won't be able to invest in everybody. However, I, it's more of me now actively seeking out companies. Like if I, I mean, I'm obsessed with going to the grocery store. I'm obsessed with trying new products. Um, my kitchen looks like a, my pantry looks like Air One 2.0. I mean, it's insane. Um, but that's part of the thing. I love going to the grocery store and talking to the managers or the people working there, stocking the shelves, asking them what kind of products are moving, what aren't, you know, what kind of stuff are customers saying, uh, what's new, can I try it? All those different things. I just, it's like an obsession with me. Um, but it's going to be interesting to see where this kind of CPG space goes because there's a lot more competition today than there was even a few years ago, mm-hmm. um, just with the ability for people to kind of start a new company. And there's there's a lot of money flowing into companies, right? Uh, I mean, we're seeing valuations skyrocketed. We're seeing investments skyrocketing. But the next plan like the the stage two of my career is has started this year with mosh i've always wanted to kind of prove out my concept of investing in these better for your health and wellness companies showing that there was a tremendous growth by this in this space by uh american consumers and now how can i take what i've learned and what i know to go and create products myself in these spaces um and that's kind of where where i've started now with mosh and want to continue to go uh, and partner up with some of my other founders that once they exit and build this kind of uh, new Kellogg, new General Mills kind of a thing, like kind of what Human Co. and, J- and Jason's doing, um, you know, something like that is is the next step for me. What about the next steps for Mosh's uh, go-to-market strategy? You started out as a direct-to-consumer brand. You currently are a direct-to-consumer brand. Eventually, to be a player in the bar space, uh, you got to be at retail. Um, what does that story look like? How are you going to talk to buyers about what you're doing? Um, and how are you going to make them care? Because, again, you know, there's a lot of competition out there, as you referenced. And getting the buyer to say yes uh, seems like it's becoming even more challenging for, for any brand. So three kind of parts to your question. Number one is, yes, we are direct consumer brand. Um, I plan on being a direct consumer brand for the foreseeable future. Two, you need to be a successful bar company. You have to go to retail. We're not going to be a successful bar company. We're going to be a successful brain health company. We aren't calling this company a bar company because we want to create other products under our Mosh platform. And you could stay direct to consumer and be extremely successful without taking one step into a retail store by creating different product lines and increasing your average order value, your lifetime value of a customer, as long as they're coming back and want to dictate what other product lines they want to see that pertain to brain health. And that's what I'm really planning on doing. That's not to say I won't go towards retail. I think that this product could be successful in retail, but I would partner with someone in retail that is mission-driven, mission-focused, and that will partner with us to market the mission to the customer and utilize end caps, utilize displays, utilize other ways to really educate the consumer about this product and its benefits than just placing it on a shelf next to 500 other bars. That won't work. But there are places like CVS now that have built out a whole brain health section of their stores. Um, you know, this the, these spaces continue to grow and i think that there'll be more opportunities in the in the years coming to do unique things with stores um but i'm not in a rush you know so direct to consumer you, you as you as you said you know it has a lot of potential and you can scale businesses direct to consumer 
Um, getting people to know about your brand, I think, is the is the big question. How do you get people yeah. to find out about your brand online um, or otherwise? Short term, long term, is there a social strategy that you've seen that has really worked for the food and beverage industry for a particular brand? And how do you apply those lessons? How do you apply that strategy to Mosh? In what sense? What kind of a other things. So direct to consumer brands often rely on social marketing um, versus offline marketing to get people aware of their brands, right, to right. get trial, to get interest, et cetera. Um, are there examples that you've seen out there, um, whether it be, you know, an Instagram presence, um, you know, paid you have to be unique. Et cetera? You have to be unique. Anybody and everybody can go out there and spend, you know, this many dollars on on Instagram ads and hope that it it works, but you know, I, I'm not a true believer in just throwing money at the at the ad cycle unless you have insane metrics and your CAC is extremely low and your LTV is extremely high and there's a uh, you know customers are on subscription and, and staying on there. Sure, that that works, but otherwise, um, I, I don't really believe in that. I think you know, for with Mosh, for example, we didn't spend anything on ads. We did this all organically and built up a, a really large email base and communicated with our customers for the last month before we launched and telling them updates and, and things that were going on behind the scenes. So we got them really excited uh, so that when we did open and we did launch, they were right there ready to buy. But I think you have to be extremely unique with what you're, you're doing in the marketing side. Five years ago, yes, just spending money on, on Instagram and Facebook worked uh, and it works to an extent today. But you have to think of unique, unique ways. Um, and whether that's partnering with a specific influencer, whether that is doing, you know, unique things on TikTok, whether that is utilizing media and creating your own podcast or your own, um, you know, show on, on LinkedIn or whatever you're doing. I, I'm, I'm seeing some, some really cool founders do interesting things um, with their brands without pushing the product. LinkedIn is a, is, is unreal. I think it's extremely underutilized by a lot of people. Um, it's one of my more powerful platforms. Of course, on Instagram, I have one and a half million followers, but they don't care as much about when I'm starting, you know, a new uh, brain health wellness product versus on on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I, I I I get more reaction on LinkedIn, more focused comments, more. Uh, focus potential customers um, than if I were to just post something on Twitter or or Facebook or um, Instagram. So I think it's extremely helpful. You know, I've made investments in companies off LinkedIn. I guess we met off LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. I've done people's podcasts off LinkedIn. So LinkedIn's been a really powerful tool for me, and I love it. Um, and uh, you know, for example, with, with Mosh, with our PR. Uh, with Nikki, who who communicated with you, we weren't doing any PR. We weren't doing any uh, spending a dollar on on a publicist or anything like that. And um, Nikki had followed me on LinkedIn from my you know for the my CPG posts and the companies I was involved in. And she messaged me after reading one of my mom's Sunday papers, and the the, the header of my mom's Sunday paper was betting on yourself and why. My mom had learned this past year to bet on herself and what that meant for her and, and investing in herself. And Nikki sent me an email saying, hey, this is me betting on myself. I know you don't know me. We've never met. You don't know my work, but I truly believe that I could help Mosh and do all these different things. And the fact that she bet on herself, I decided to, to, to work with her. Um, I still have never met her, but it all happened through LinkedIn. LinkedIn is also good about, you know, when you're trying to find new product, I would, I would, I would hope that most people are finding new products via BevNet and Nosh and Taste Radio. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, you have seen your fair share of brands on all those platforms that we mentioned. The question I have, though, is how have you not invested in an ice cream brand yet? Because <laughs> I know I think that's part of my <laughs> Mr. Stage. Ice Cream himself. <laughs> I know. I think it's part of my stage, too, where I might just create my own brand one day. But that, that's more of a passion project down the road, I'm sure. But as an investor, I'm sure you know, I, ice cream's tough. I mean, I mean, the frozen section is mafia-esque. It's, it's uh, you know, extremely hard to ship and to, to keep things cold and frozen and the weight. And uh, you can't really do it as a direct-to-consumer company. 
Um, and it's been really kind of up and down of what customers are looking for. Are they really wanting that healthier alternative halo top type of a thing? Or are they just wanting the full blown indulgent, full fat, cool brands? It's been going up and down. So I don't know one day maybe, but it would be, it'd be more of like, I'll, I'll open like a local parlor on the, on the corner of where I live. Well, if your track record is any indication, it sounds like you're on your way to another success in your life. And I'm wishing you all the luck. And I think, you know, Mosh is off to a great start, as I mentioned. And I, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how this, how this all plays out, you know, from too. Far beyond what's that? I said, me too. <laughs> <laughs> well, know that you will always uh, have a special place in our hearts, uh, you know, for all the work that you've done as a co-host for Elevator Talk, for joining us today on Taste Radio, and for generally being an awesome guy. I think, you know, one oh, of your thanks. greatest qualities, Patrick, is that you are uh, through and through, you know, an honest and decent guy. And I think, you know, I've known that and I've felt that from day one. So I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me before, now, and hopefully into the future. Of course. Well, thank you. I really appreciate those words. And I'm sure my mom will like to hear that when she listens. She'll probably just fast forward to hear that. But uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ray. I appreciate it. And anytime you want to talk, I'm, I'm always game and uh, always game to host and everything else. So just let me know. Fantastic. Uh, once again, Patrick, really appreciate everything that you've done and uh, hope to catch up again really soon. Thank you, man. You too. All right. Thank you.